be it a Picasso, a Pete Doig or a Banksy. Art has always held its place in the popular consciousness as desirable and not surprisingly has garnered significant interest as a medium of investment. Today, with Mr. James Ellis, we take a deeper look at art as an investment and the how, what and why of it. James is the head of underwriting for the private clients division of AXA Gulf, which is currently transitioning to GIG Gulf. He spent the first 16 years of his career in the UK and Europe, also working in various technical underwriting roles with wealthy individuals to protect their physical assets. He is qualified as a chartered insurer with the Chartered Inst- Insurance Institute and holds a graduate degree in politics and economics from Goldsmiths College at the University of London. Welcome, James. Thank you. I hope I that did, did you justice, the introduction. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, you know, many a time when, when we do these introductions, I wish my wife was here to, 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 to listen. Um, but it's been a long journey for you, uh, like we were chatting, uh, you know, and it has been in the the private client space. And as a result of that, you've been, you've become very familiar with uh, with art as a as a um, both as a subject in terms of uh, you know as a, um, as an appreciator of art, if I may, mm-hmm. and uh, as as a professional as well. That's right. Um, and if you'd like to. Uh, talk about it, I'd like to understand a little bit about you know, the evolution of, of really art as a medium for investment. How did art become something that people would want to invest money in? Okay. So, yeah, my, my background, I actually, by complete coincidence, uh-huh. Goldsmiths College, where I went to university, is predominantly known as, a, as an arts uh, college. Oh, <laughs> um, okay. Although my degree was in politics and economics there, uh-huh. there a lot of... Um, Modern art, uh, contemporary artists came through that institution. So the likes of Damien Hirst, for example, was studied yep. at um, Goldsmiths. So uh, I sort of, when I was at uh, university, I, I knew a lot of aspiring artists, so that kind of sparked an interest in it. Um, and then from there, I went into the, the private clients area in insurance, sort mm-hmm. of fell into that. But um, I became sort of overwhelmed by the passion with which people in that particular segment of insurance, insurance is quite a dry industry, but yeah. people in that segment were very passionate about the things that they were protecting for wealthy individuals. So that's kind of how I, I got into Sorry. it. And from there, I started to gain a bit of knowledge about art. Mm. In terms of the evolution of art um, as an investment, it's quite an interesting topic. I mean, it, Going back as far as sort of the early 1900s, the first art funds mm. were uh, created. I think the first one that, that people generally refer to was, like I say, about the turn of the, um, the start of the 20th century, when there was a fund created by um, some people who bought what we now know as of as uh, impressionist mm. works. They grouped together and, and bought a lot of the impressionist paintings. Of course, at the time, it wasn't Impressionism, it yeah. was just contemporary art, but sure. the, that sort of became the first fund. What really, art uh, as an investor, uh, before that had been a, a passion thing, a collector's thing, and sure. that continued really through most of the earliest, early 20th century. A date that a lot of people point to as when art really became an investment is sort of the, the 70s, the first uh, time that, that uh, an ins- uh, corporation if you like bought a lot of art as a pure investment in the early 70s the british railways Mm. pension fund um, acquired a a lot of artwork they put about three percent three or four percent i think of their of their entire fund into artwork which was absolutely unheard of at the time and from there developed this uh investability in art and and that was really the start of kind of corporate collections. You, you now see a lot of corporations that have yeah. holdings of, uh, of fine art. Oh, absolutely. I think it's, it's extended uh, quite well, not just uh, you know, uh, with corporations anymore, but very very wealthy private individuals yeah, who co- you know, have a lot of collections. Um, and so just picking on uh, the timeline that you mentioned there, for a very long period of time, uh, it was probably the artists, post the, the artists uh, passing away, that 
uh, their art really sort of took off and became yep. uh, famous and was valued and you know those kind of things but we've seen a movement from those uh, from that time where you know it was more um, that type of uh, art that got celebrated to today where you have living artists uh, can you give us a little perspective on that and how did that happen yeah i mean there's always been an artist that made money during their lifetime out of our work mm-hmm. Going back to Michelangelo, the, the Sistine, he was paid by the Catholic Church to create the, the Sistine Chapel roof and, and was a wealthy man in his own time. But it wasn't really an investable thing. Mm. I guess uh, sort of the, the 50s or thereabouts, you had figures like um, Picasso, who in his own lifetime, um, his work sold for what would be about a million dollars, I suppose, or so mm. now. And from there, that trend kind of accelerated um, you to the point where Recently, you had uh, a Hockney and um, Jeff Koons works that sold for about $90 million, both living artists. I think in general terms, artists that have passed away remain and always will be more uh, valuable, simply from an economic point of view, yeah. because of the fact that there... Is in more supply. Yeah, there's no supply. The supply is finished once they've passed yeah. away. So there's a finite amount of those works in existence. They're generally pretty well documented for the... Very um, most valuable artists, so, so they are generally more expensive. But there is this trend, like you say, for living artists' work to appreciate a lot during their lifetime. Mm. Yeah, and uh, so if uh, if one were to want to get into the sort of uh, art realm, if you will, for someone who's not very familiar with it but is interested in sort of uh, getting getting their foot wet uh, and getting a sense of uh, what and how to go about it, what would your advice be? And how would you uh, guide them? Well, <laughs> that's a very <laughs> uh, broad question, really. Yeah. I mean, the, the good thing about the time that we're in now is that there's actually arts more accessible than it ha- ever has been. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of ways that you can um, that you can get into art. There's obviously galleries, uh, dealers. There are lots of fine art consultants, curators, um, there's now thing uh, there's, there's art fairs worldwide. We have our own here, Art Dubai. Um, there's the affordable art fair, which is a, a movement of art fairs around the world to sell uh, well affordable art. <laughs> the yep. clues in the title. Um, there's of course auctions. Mm-hmm. Um, now there's a big move. Even the the bigger auction and houses and sales rooms have moved towards online auctions. So there's there's a, a uh, clear move in that direction there's of course um, fractional art ownership shares of artwork there's there's no end of entry routes Mm. the move uh, towards online I think is really um, opening up the art world to more people because uh, to go to a live auction if you've got no experience in that is a it's a very intimidating environment I mean I I don't there's a lot of pressure is it like the, sorry to interrupt, but is it like the movies? I mean, where you know you've got the, the typical <laughs> scenes of the auctioneer there and talking yeah, about a piece for, of art. For very high end auctions, yeah, it's yes. absolutely like that. And of course, you're in a room with other people yeah. who are, th- there's a buzz going on. There's an auctioneer looking at you. There's uh-huh. a curator <laughs> probably who's researched the artwork for you. There's a lot of pressure. Whereas um, online, yeah. people still get carried away <laughs> in online okay. auctions, but there's there's less. Pressure, so that, that right. I think gives an easier entry point for, for some people. That's interesting, and um, I think the the, the one uh, question that sort of seems to pop up, uh, you know, as a result of that is, how do you know it's genuine, or how do you, you know, yeah, with how do you trust? One is obviously the institution that's conducting it, but uh, still, I mean, I think we've watched far too many movies where there've been, uh, uh, you know, various things that have happened to artworks, uh, right from duplication to. Yep. Um, I mean, something being stolen. So uh, how do you really actually verify a piece of art? I mean, there's no getting away from the fact that that's a risk in the art world and that there have been high-profile incidences of, of works being faked yeah. and, and people losing a lot of money. Um, I think the key, the key to that really, like any investment, is doing thorough research. Now, art's a very uh, long-term investment. Yep. Um, it's highly illiquid you can't just sell artworks over overnight um, like you can a, a stock or a share or whatever Correct. so 
it's worth putting in a lot of effort into the research phase at the start and engaging with professionals who know what they're talking about. I mean, mm. you can speak to curators, researchers. Again, there's, there are in art investment specialists now yeah. who will do a lot of the legwork for you in determining a work's provenance, cool. making sure it has the correct documentation. If you're dealing with an auction house, um, they accept some of the responsibility for the um, listing of that artwork and do some of that background work for you. But again, you should always do your own uh, research into these pieces mm. as well. I mean, it's less of a problem, I would say, at the uh, entry point if you are buying directly from a gallery or artist, obviously. Sure. You, you know that Absolutely. that's a, yeah. an original piece. As you get into the higher echelons of art, it becomes more of a risk because the values are higher. Very high. No, absolutely, I think. Um, and so sort of going into that, uh, I mean, like you mentioned, so when it gets into the, the higher net worth uh, space, um, I mean, what do you think are the reasons that generally it's uh, something that they consider as part of an investment uh, decision rather than you know, just for the appreciation of it? Yeah. Okay, so I think, I mean, with a lot of wealthy clients, I think it's quite often the entry point is that, that they they become passionate about an artist or a work, and they, you know, physical art, not only is it um, an asset that can appreciate, but it, it takes up a lot of space. You yeah. know, it needs to be maintained. It's, <laughs> uh, you know, it, it can be a cumbersome thing to, to look after, so... There's, there's, with wealthy people, there's always going to be the entry point. If they like something and they want something beautiful to look at in their home, I think there's also like a, a psychological component to it. Certainly, yeah, a prestige component in owning a unique object that um, that only you can can view or have access to. I think that's sort of hardwired into the human psyche. That that will always be there. But then, aside from that, from an investment point of view. The advantage for wealthy people of artwork is that the the art market seldom moves in tandem with the broader economy, or it's mm. very it, changes in art prices are not strongly correlated with the shares or, sure. or the bond market or whatever. So, in terms of thinking about a diverse portfolio, a diverse long term portfolio, it makes sense to have some yeah. artwork because it's just diversifying it's not your exposure correlated. to the to the broader economy. No, absolutely. I think that that's a fantastic point that you raised there. I mean, it's not correlated, which means that uh, in scenarios where th there is a lot of fluctuation, you, you yeah. know that this is going to be decoupled from that, which is great. Exactly. Um, and um, so, I mean, are there different categories of art? How do you look at it? How do they? How do you sort of pick a category that you invest in? Uh, which is the safest? Which is the 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 most riskiest? Which gives you the most return? I know a lot of questions I'm throwing at you <laughs> yeah. there, but uh, it's fascinating, and I'd like to hear you. Talk yeah. about it. So, I mean, art can be and is segmented in lots of different ways. I mean, there's, there's obviously there's paintings, mm -hmm. sculpture, yep. mechanical art, uh, object art, the different categories of the, the physical um, attributes of, of that piece. It's also segmented very often in periods. So I talked about Impressionism earlier. Correct. The Cubist movement. Cubist. I mean... Uh, contemporary art now, uh, post-war art. So there's lots of different ways that it can be segmented. And then geographically as well, like um, Russian art versus mm. uh, European art, sure. Chinese art and so on. Th these are all sort of distinct categories. The From an investment point of view, I mean, I'm not qualified to give investment sure. advice per se, but okay. it makes, as with any investment, I mean, the, the more you diversify your portfolio, mm the uh, less exposed you are to uh, highs and lows within a, a specific segment. Sure. So it makes sense to um, to diversify. The values, um, it, it, that's quite a difficult one to ask uh, answer. I mean, obviously, the, the highest value work that's ever been sold at auctions is um, Salvador Mundi, is it like an, a, a uh, Renaissance piece. Mm. Um, impressionist works hold their value extremely well but don't come up for sale that often and yeah. aren't that accessible to most people um there's a lot of post uh, 
uh, war art segments that are, that perform very well. Uh, Warhol, for example, uh-huh. and some of the uh, like pop artists okay. um, hold their value very well. But again, these are very sort of long term investments. You are waiting for the right buyer to come up to purchase that yeah. piece from you, and, and that can take a long time um, to materialise. The, I suppose the riskiest uh, segment to get into is new. Riskiest in terms of whether or not you will realise a return is is probably new up and coming artists because you just don't know how their uh, works are going to be perceived in the in the future or after their death or whatever. However, that represents the easiest entry point because the values, values are, are, are much lower. So, um, so learning about trends in the market which artists are performing well again that research thing like doing a, a, a lot of research before you invest is, yeah. is crucial and how do you access uh, these these uh, you know these either research papers or i'm assuming you, how would someone go about yeah i mean the best like speak to people who are in the art world curators uh art investment experts get as much information as you can from as much sources as possible really try and understand the artists that you're thinking about um, buying in their, their background how their works have performed in the past you, auction prices yep. you can generally get a public record of those yeah. what's sort of unique about the uh, the art world to a degree is that there's a lot of or where it differs from traditional investments is that there's a private sale element to it as well as what's public, public yeah. so it can be difficult to find out what's going on in the in the private space yep. but public auctions you can generally find out um, information about how a, an artist is performed. Excellent. Um, you briefly touched upon um, you know some of the segments. Uh, one of the things that's uh, sort of always fascinated me is uh, uh, collectibles. Uh, yep. You know I mean we've heard the stories of uh, I mean whether it's a Gary V and talk, he talks about baseball cards uh, the, or you know so many of them. Um, how does that sort of fit into uh, an invest as as an investment because they do hold value and grow in value and yeah. would that be uh, something that investors look at frequently and I mean we, I think we <laughs> have mentioned this before when we've been talking we could do a whole podcast yeah. on different uh, forms of collectibles but uh, yeah like people collect an awful lot of things these days and see the value in uh, like having stored value of rare mm. rare things so be that um, vintage trainer collections, mm. um, oh, yeah. or sneaker connections, uh, comic books. I mean, I, I was lucky enough to uh, go and visit someone in London who had a, a, an enormous, a huge collection, probably one of the largest collections in the world of, of comic books, called probably 15 years ago or so. Mm. And that has subsequently, the collection was sold and realised a, a huge amount of money. Mm. Much, much more than he spent, I'm sure, on building the collection uh something we see in this region a lot is is uh handbags uh-huh. Hermes handbags unique handbags where the materials are no longer uh produced mm-hmm. these are becoming extremely collectible right. uh, high net worth inv- individuals look at things like classic cars which again it's the rarity value uh, it, there's only a limited number of those mm-hmm. things still in existence Correct. depending on the vehicle it's connected to things like uh, racing, so yep. there's only one car that won the Millie Miglia in X year or whatever, so that therefore becomes extremely um, valuable. Mm. To uh, rare whiskies, mm. rare wines. Yeah. I mean, you could a- anything that someone has a passion for collecting. We we've seen it <laughs> in the insurance industry, and these things are appreciating in value. Yeah, and I think uh, so. Sort of bringing in that uh, the element of uh, the insurance aspects of it. I mean, uh, just to sort of uh, you know, what are the risks to either art or collectibles that generally you see uh, collectors or investors face? Yeah. Uh, and you know, is there an element of insurance that can help uh, with those? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, art insurance is a very sort of well-defined um, segment in the insurance sector. So there's several different things. I mean, a, a, people who have large collections of artwork tend to loan that work out mm-hmm. f- uh, or send it to exhibitions, be it uh, for museums, museums that want to exhibit, yeah. do an exhibit of a 
um, a specific artist or fine art fairs or whatever. So with that comes some inherent risks in transporting and packing artwork. Sure. Um, so you need to, again, en engage the help of someone who really is a specialist in, in logistics for artwork. They know the right type of crates to pack um, valuable pieces in. They know how to protect that piece while it's being shipped halfway around the world. They know the liability that the museum or the consignee should be assuming yep. to make sure that that's in place and, um, and, and that your insurance will cover you what we provide while, you're, while your piece is being shipped and transited around the world. That's one aspect of it. Sure. Because then a lot of people who are larger collectors don't necessarily keep their artwork at their home. They obviously store it because, yeah. again... If you've got a large collection, it takes up a lot of space. Yeah. Um, so there are risks inherent in that and in selecting where you store that artwork, making sure that, for example, it has adequate uh, protections from fire, adequate um, fire alarms, um, that the civil defence in this region can get to it quickly. Uh, should anything go wrong, um, inherent problems with things like leaks from mm. air conditioning and so on and... Yeah. and being aware of how your work is stored, sure. flooding, water can ingress Great. into either a home or a storage location and that can cause horrific damage to pieces of work. Yeah. Um, w water is a real big potential risk for paintings Great. in particular. So paintings on a wall, if you have pipes behind that that can yeah. burst or air conditioning units above, that kind of thing. These are all things that need to be thought about yep. and they're the kind of advice that a good uh, insurance company, insurance broker will give you around uh, sure. the protection of your artwork. Yeah, no, um, I think it's good to, to be able to sort of consider and think about those things, especially for, I mean, some of the investors are, you know, the veterans of it. So they've, they've probably gone yeah. through that and they know, but uh, there is a great uh, mid-segment or, uh, you know, on one side the more experienced, the other side the complete uh, newcomer to the, yeah. to the field, but the mid-segment that is sort of uh, looking at this and has tried a little bit and has bought maybe a few pieces and they've they've got it displayed at home or they've stored it at uh, some place. So um, it's, it's good that uh, they consider those factors and uh, protect themselves against, uh, against those things. Um, coming to, uh, you know, the, the risks, the, uh, we've, as a, um, as, as, you know, all over the globe, uh, as, as, as people, I think, uh, we've gone through a period of, uh, you know, almost two years, slightly over two years now, um, where we've dealt with the pandemic. Uh, we've seen many impacts that the pandemic has had, whether it's on the economy uh, or whether it's on the markets, etc. But, um, you know, in the art world and uh, with regard to art, what has been the impact? Have you seen any uh, impact that you can sort of uh, share with us? Yeah. So... I mean, it's, it's difficult to talk about impact in terms of like percentage returns or anything sure. like that. But in terms of the art market in general, the pandemic was extremely disruptive, I would say, for, the, for um, 2020 in particular. Uh -huh. um, obviously, the lack of physical uh, auctions and people being able to go and see to galleries or dealers and so on had a real impact on art sales, art volume of sales and value of sales. Mm. It did, though, herald this shift that I talked about before more towards online. Correct. So the online segment grew, but not enough to make up for the, the drop in sales and volume. Got it. However, in 2021, as things opened up again, the art market sort of roared back into life. The uh, sales reached pre-pandemic, levels uh -huh. straight away and you also had this like I say shift to online which many people think has brought um, a new uh, art to a new audience and that bodes well for the future um, values of art potentially more, more people collecting more people buying yeah. that should lead to strong performance over the coming years it's difficult to um, it's difficult to say exactly what impact that would that period will have on prices, mm. but it feels like the sort of the art market's re recovered, if you like, already. That's great to that's great to hear. Um, so that's that's uh, of course that's great to hear that uh, we're we're back to pre-pandemic levels. And um, one thing that uh, that you mentioned, I mean, with art going a lot more online and uh, being sort of more digital in nature, 
a couple of things have happened and i'm going to talk about one first and then then the second one uh one is uh the whole fractional investment uh into our uh, sort of movement that has happened um it's interesting because it makes it accessible to a lot more people but it's also you know how does that whole thing work i mean ownership you've got one square centimeter or an inch of an artwork or you know so what are your thoughts how does that sort of really contribute towards the progression of uh, uh, you know art yeah. being an investable medium so fractional art you you are effectively buying a share in a piece of an art or a, a fund of artwork mm. in order to make a return i mean it, it is more a uh, an investment thing than a than a passion for art thing per se but mm. the good thing about that is that it hopefully brings people people gain that passion for art by uh participating sure in fractional art ownership um i mean i i can't comment on it too broadly there's been some resistance to it in, huh? art, in the traditional art world but you know generally the more people who are interested in art the better for the art market overall okay. so i think that's a good thing i think it brings a lara entry point yep. um, it also takes some of the risk of research and so on away from you as the as the purchaser yeah, because absolutely. the fund or the the in investment art yeah. manager if you like is is responsible for that largely there's lots of different businesses out there that do it in slightly different ways so that's quite yeah. a broad sort of brush um that I'm giving you there but the but broadly that's that's the way I yeah. see that yeah it's interesting like you said i think uh, it lowers the entry point uh plus i i mean it's 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 a great way to be associated with a painting that you're uh, or an art a piece of art that you're passionate about or that you enjoy yeah and it's also like the, these sort of art funds have existed historically but in in the past they were where they were perhaps more like a hedge fund where mm. there was a very you know you had to almost be selected and put up a large amount of money to to get into that fund okay. with fractional art where it's less like i say the the entry point is lower and it uh, um you can encourage younger people who are starting down a journey towards an art collection um to participate yeah and uh, i think that that sort of uh, nicely fits in into the second part of uh, the question with regard to the online and digital space and you know the younger audiences have absolutely uh, seeming uh, to have taken this up uh, a lot and Uh, and i'm of course referring to nfts here and uh, uh, we've seen that as a result of the pandemic there has been um you know a lot of interest a lot of exposure with regard to nfts um you know what's your what you know what's your take on that do you, what do you think about the whole movement towards a, a digital transformation of art i mean again it, it, like nfts are much controversial is the right word but they 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 can be divisive in the mm. in the traditional art world okay um obviously there's been some very really in the last uh, two years some very high profile sales of yes. very high value works but in terms of the overall volume of um, nft sales generally they do tend to be quite low value and it's younger Correct. people who are who are buying them yep um interestingly high net worth individuals are starting to take an interest mm. as well. So it is kind of permeating into the um, traditional art world. There there was a survey done recently in which a lot of finite worth individuals said they would consider um making an NFT purchase in the future or any form of digital or yeah. tokenized art. The um last year if I'm getting the numbers right I'll give you like rough numbers here but the average high net worth collector spent about 200 $50,000 sure. on artwork mm-hmm. something like that. They spent about $9,000 on NFT. Oh wow. Our work. Oh. So it's it's a very small fraction of their overall Correct. spend. Correct. But nevertheless it's a tentative step absolutely in that direction and you've got to think that that will only expand um in yeah. the future. There's an you know a lot of traditional people people in the traditional art world there's some high profile um scams if you like that that have happened with NFT so yes. there's a bit of resistance there and there's also uncertainty about how NFT's sales fit into existing legal frameworks mm-hmm. so whilst uh, 
the idea of, N- of NFTs is to be in a distributed um, ledger. Network. Correct. Um, if they're being sold through auction houses, there's still sort of an existing legal framework by which you buy purchase things through auction houses. So right. those those two things don't necessarily perfectly align, and that over time you've got to think that the new kind of legal infrastructures will be developed that, yes. that uh, respond. To that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, there there is a need for uh, more a little bit of a, a sort of um, governance framework or some some kind of a body that sort of um, establishes some ground rules, and while the entire concept of uh, you know digital and crypto and uh, the blockchain per se is uh, is to move away from that, but in order for people to sort of get some some level of uh, trust, I think that that's something that we probably see happening. Um, so just a, a sort of sideway from uh, uh, you know, take from from there. Uh, do you see um, with digital sort of starting off and gaining more pop- popularity, uh, one of two things: either there's an impact in uh, into what sort of goes in into the traditional art investment. Do you see digital affecting that yeah. uh, in any manner? Uh, and also, do you see artists themselves sort of moving from traditional mediums to digital mediums? Um, you know. Uh. So I'll, I'll answer the second part of that first. Um, artists moving from traditional to digital, I don't think, this is just purely my opinion, I, sure. I don't think an artist that is making physical art will necessarily move to, or, or a large number will move to producing digital art. Mm. I think what will happen is that artists that are creating physical art will start to use technology to sell potentially shares in pieces of art or different um, you know create uh, various editions of, of a piece that will yep. be that have a token attached to it and cool. then, um, it could potentially be traded in the future so I I, th- I think my sense is that the two things will remain slightly separate I'm sure there will be some overlap some artists yeah. yeah that will overlap and sure. you know, maybe many artists that will but I think there'll always be a separate physical art market to a digital art market. That's the second part. In terms of, uh, sorry, the first part of the question. Um, The first part was whether it is going to impact the traditional investment. So, I mean, do you see that? That's right. uh, So I, personally, I don't think so, no, because I think that with, I think the psychologies are slightly different. There needs to be sort of a, a, like a, there's there's two different mentalities involved. Mm. With collecting artwork, I think there will all, or physical artwork, I think there will always be a space for people who want beautiful things to look at that they own and possess. We talked about earlier yeah. that psychological thing of of having something that no one, <laughs> no yeah. one else can uh, have to it. Something which is tangible and, and something which is tangible, something you can look at and admire and um, that that you know is yours. With pure like NFT or digital art. The mentality is a shift from sort of being something that's unique to you to something that everybody can view, Mm. but that you are the owner of. So there's a slightly different psychology involved in those two things, I think. So I think digital art will undoubtedly grow hugely over the next um, 10 years or so. Um, but I think there will always be a space for physical artwork as well, and I think the two things will kind of grow in tandem. It, it, digital art will become a bigger share, I'm sure, of a lot of traditional um, investors' portfolios, mm. but physical art will still so always good. command um, a place. Uh, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And uh, one last uh, last question. Um, any particular favourites of yours? Do you own any uh, pieces uh, that, that you'd like to share with us? <laughs> no, I, I'm not. I, I mean, I'm an enthusiast in art by virtue of the fact that I have been very lucky to um, visit a number of um, private collectors' homes and collections and, yep. and see these these magnificent pieces. Um, the I once walked into a, a room unbeknownst with me at, at a very large collector's home uh-huh. where they had on the wall an original. Monet and an original constable, and that wow. was absolutely 
breathtaking. I've never sort of experienced anything like that, really. Yeah. So that sort of, yeah, I guess, impressionism. I like a lot of the pop artists mm. as well, Liechtenstein, those kind of people. Okay. Um, yeah. No, mm. Fantastic. Uh, thank you so much, James. It's been a pleasure. And uh, before we let you go, uh, is there a, a message to the audience that you'd like to give or somewhere where they can find you or, you know, or, or you know, look up uh, the kind of things that the company yeah. uh, is into and doing? I mean, I would just say we're at, uh, at AXA Private Clients. We are specialists in uh, insuring artwork and yeah. high-value collections and so on. Visit our website, um, axagolf.com, axa-golf.com. And uh, you can find out all about our products. We're also uh, in the process of uh, changing from AXA Golf to GIG Golf. Yep. Um, your viewers and listeners may not be aware that AXA Golf sold their uh, uh, their business in this region to a company called GIG, who are a Q80 company. Mm-hmm. Um, and really we're going through a transition to a new brand which we're all very excited to share in the, in the coming weeks um, nothing has changed with the business per se from a sure. customer's point of view um, it's exactly the same management team exactly the same products exactly the same service but we will be changing from AXA to GIG and right. I would encourage everyone to, to look into that you'll start to see some media around it soon I'm sure. alright thank you very much and all the very best thank you